Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of my message this morning is Why People Treated Jesus Like a Victorious King. When we read and study the New Testament, we find that a lot of people oppose Jesus and we tend to focus on the opposition because there is a lot of truth to be gained from learning why people oppose Jesus. Jesus was a threat to the establishment, was the main thing. He was a threat to the established religion of the day. He was a, a threat. The government saw him as a threat. Various people saw Jesus as a threat, even economically and for different reasons. But today, I want to focus on why people treated Jesus like a victorious king on this day that we call Palm Sunday. Now, I want all the children who have a, a palm branch to reach up high and wave it, okay? Reach up high and we've got palm branches around. Thank you for that image earlier this morning when you walked around the sanctuary three or four times. Uh, I was getting tired just watching you. <laughs> All right, thank you. You can put the branches down and then uh, during the message, if you just feel like you need to wave the palm branch and remind us that it's Palm Sunday, again, that's okay. I've got several scriptures for you today. Uh, the first one is found in Zechariah uh, 9, chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. This is a prophecy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, it's a wonderful day on the Christian calendar, Palm Sunday. It's remembered as the day that Jesus went to Jerusalem on this donkey and people laid their cloaks and branches on the ground before him in a way that we roll out the red carpet today. Before they had red carpets to roll out, this is what they did. And around the world today, people are remembering this event as we lead up to Resurrection Sunday next week. And today, I ask the question and answer the question, why people saw Jesus as a victorious king? I actually have seven points to my message this morning. Normally, I'm a three-point guy. I have heard as many as ten points in a sermon before. I haven't quite gotten there. Why did people see Jesus as a victorious king? Here's my overview. Because he had power over nature, because he had power over sickness, because he updated the law of Moses, because he knew more than the religious people of the day, because he had power over death, and because he had no fear of anything, and people also saw Jesus as a victorious king because of large crowd mentality. Now, if I were to propose this question this morning is, how can a king be victorious? How could a president, how could a leader of any country be victorious if he is lowly and riding on a donkey? A king in this day rode a horse. He rode a mighty horse. A king who wanted peace rode a donkey. Jesus wanted peace. Jesus did not want war. Why did people see Jesus as a victorious king? Because he had power over nature. Matthew chapter 21 verse 9 tells us, seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, no longer shall there ever be any fruit from you, and at once the tree withered. I wondered about this passage, and I had a hunch, so I looked up 
at once. Your translation of the scripture might say instantly. At once comes from the Greek word parakrama, which means instantly, immediately, on the spot. <laughs> which means this fig tree didn't just wither in the days ahead, it withered immediately. Jesus said, you're never going to bear fruit. And everybody saw it just wither right there. It didn't wither over the next few days so that people could say it was already going to die. But it happened instantly right before their eyes. Mark chapter 4, Jesus and his disciples were in a boat in a terrible storm. And when the disciples panicked, Jesus slept. When Jesus was awakened by the disciples, Jesus said, peace, be still. And nature immediately obeyed. The disciples said, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Well, I had another hunch from scripture. Be still or quiet or silent. Your translation might say the Greek word is fomo, which is to muzzle, to put to silence, to reduce to silence. Now, there, some of you are going to learn something new here this morning. You, you didn't know you were going to end for something, learning something new this morning, did you? Have you ever gone out on a boat when there were no waves, early morning, just as placid as it can be, and when your boat gets in the water, you interrupt that placid state, and for the rest of the day, that body of water will have some bit of waves. And then if you go to Old Hickory Lake or Percy Priest on a warm summer day and you see all the boats and the wave runners and the skiers and all this, you have turbulent water. It takes a long time for that water to calm down. If you pulled all the boats out of the water at one time, it would still take a while for the water to become placid again. Now, after a storm, it's even more so. After a storm, the water is still turbulent until it calms down naturally. But this Greek word, famuo, to reduce to silence, means instantly. The storm didn't just stop, followed by hours of calming seas. The storm stopped immediately, and the sea was calm. So it wasn't, it wasn't like the people could have said, well, the storm was just about over. It was, the storm was on its last leg, and, and Jesus just happened to say, peace, be still. He knew he was a good weather man, and he just knew that the weather was about to change. No, that's not what happened. When Jesus said, peace, be still, the weather went from a turbulent storm with waves just rushing and coming over the boat and tossing and turning this boat to completely still. Jesus had power over nature. No earthly king had power over nature. Next, why did people see Jesus as a victorious king? Because he had power over sickness. Leprosy, palsy, hemorrhaging, blindness, epilepsy, dropsy, deafness, muteness. And Jesus even had power over demon possession and as he cast demons out of people. He healed people because of their faith. He healed people because of others' faith. And he healed people just because he liked doing it. Mark chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed. And he healed them, large crowds from Galilee. Remember that. The, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. The fame of Jesus spread... And the name of Jesus became a household name. Everybody knew who Jesus was. And they didn't have internet. 
no cell phone, no landline, no TV, no radio, word of mouth. People knew who Jesus was. Earthly kings did not have power over sickness. In fact, an earthly king would have thought he was too great for someone to bring a sick person to him and ask for healing. Why did people see Jesus as a victorious king? Because Jesus updated the law of Moses. <laughs> Some saw that as blasphemy. The law of Moses had been around since who? Moses. It was actually God's law given through Moses. Nobody questioned the law of Moses. The rabbis taught it. The Pharisees took pride in following it. But no one dared question it. No one dared change it. In fact, they added to it. And then here comes Jesus who declared himself Lord of the Sabbath. Now when I say they added to the law of Moses, what I meant by that is they, they added laws out of respect to the law of Moses. Matthew chapter 12, verses 10 through 13. A man was there whose hand was withered, and he questioned Jesus, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So they might accuse him. And Jesus said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take a hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable then is a man than this sheep? So then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and it was restored to normal like the other, another instant healing. The Pharisees there all wanted to catch Jesus and trick him because you weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He wrecked their little theology because by this time, their theology had indeed become little. Earthly kings did not have the power to update the law of Moses. Why did people see Jesus as a victorious king? Because he knew more than religious people. Jesus argued with the Pharisees and he won every single argument. There was, there was no losing argument. There was no draw. Jesus won every single argument with the Pharisees. He questioned their actions. He questioned their morals. He even called them hypocrites. I think Jesus enjoyed calling the Pharisees hypocrites because that's what they were. He was, just, he was calling them what they were. One Christian writer said this, during the start of his ministry, Jesus' ministry, the body of the Pharisees would have been interested to hear what Jesus had to say. They were interested in hearing what any teacher in Israel had to say. The problem that they had with Jesus was his monumental claims and the authority in which he spoke. No man had ever spoken like this man. No man had ever won the favor of the masses so quickly and so thoroughly. He even went so far as to claim that he was the very reason for the scripture and the fulfillment of it. Their, their opposition against him grew to a point that they had plotted his death. And when Jesus was to be arrested, the Pharisees were among those who came to take Jesus away. Earthly kings did not have more religious knowledge than the rabbis and the Pharisees. Why did the people see Jesus as a victorious king? Because he had power over death. You'll hear people say that the only one to raise from the dead was Jesus. Not so. The more accurate statement is this. Jesus is the only one to conquer death. Jesus resurrected several from the dead before he himself was resurrected. So there are people who have been resurrected from the dead, but it was only because of Jesus, because Jesus has the keys to death and hell. Jesus is the master, and he can laugh at death as he wishes. In Luke chapter 7 and 8, he raised the dead son of a widow, and he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. And then in 
John chapter 11, we've got this dramatic account of Jesus' power over death. Starting in verse 38, the scripture says, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they might believe that you have sent me. <laughs> and when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now, this resurrection was different than the other resurrections that Jesus, uh, when Jesus raised people from the dead, this guy had been wrapped up. <laughs> the scripture says that he came out, wrapped up. Let me out of here. <laughs> and Jesus told them what to do to unwrap him. Earthly kings did not have power over death. Why did people see Jesus as a victorious king? Because he had no fear of anything. Don't you want to follow a leader who has truly no fear of anything? Don't you want a king, a savior who has no fear of anything? In the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus agonized in prayer, he did not doubt and he was not afraid. And the reason we know this is because doubt and fear are sins according to the Bible. And the Bible says that in his human state, he experienced all that we experience yet without sin. Jesus said in Matthew chapters 14 and 21, which we'll read 21 here in a few minutes in Mark 11, that doubt is the opposite of faith. And Jesus told his disciples in Matthew to have no fear over those who would persecute them. Several times in Scripture, Jesus said, Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. Earthly kings had their fears. Earthly kings were always afraid that someone would try to take their throne from within their own camp. And earthly kings were also afraid that their enemies might overtake them. They had to be constantly vigilant. But Jesus didn't have to be constantly vigilant. And so now here we have Jesus with victorious power over nature, with power over sickness, with, with authority over the law of Moses, even updating it, and with more knowledge than religious people, and with power over death, and with no fear of anyone or anything. No wonder Jesus was so popular. No wonder the Sanhedrin, no wonder the Pharisees felt threatened. No wonder the government felt threatened. And the Jews had come to the area to celebrate the Passover meal. It was their yearly celebration. I've told you about it so many times. I, I hope you could uh, share with me what the Passover meal was. And in Genesis, the Hebrew people had been enslaved for many years. And ex Genesis and Exodus tells us this story. And God sent the death angel to take the firstborn of those who did not spread the blood of the lamb over their doors. And the, uh, the Egyptians did not do this, and their firstborn children died. The Hebrews did it, and their firstborn children lived. Now, all these years later, they still observe this. They observed the Passover. And now this lamb of God, Jesus came into the city because Jesus was about to shed his blood for those who would believe. And as Jesus did so, as he came into the city, 
Throngs of people followed. Look in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 21. And as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, which is what I read to you at the beginning of the sermon. And here it is, repeated again in Matthew chapter 21. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. And this brings me to my next point. Why did Jesus, why did the people see Jesus as a victorious king? Because of large crowd mentality. It's what we call the bandwagon effect. The bandwagon effect is this. Everyone's doing this, why not join us? Everyone says this, why not join us? Everybody's voting for this candidate, why not vote for this candidate? And so people tend to believe that there's legitimacy because a crowd is large. Look in verse 8. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, a few, only a few days later, this large crowd, would be swayed by the sweeping popular opinion that this king needed to be crucified. Large crowd mentality can easily become an angry mob if they're not committed from the beginning. And it's amazing how people can turn in such a short period of time. We've seen lots of demonstrations on television that started out peaceful that turned into nothing more than an angry mob. It can happen. And these people who lifted up Jesus and just saw him as their hero and their king and laid their, their cloaks and their palm branches in front of him turned from him. And so that on that cruel, ugly cross, he would be virtually alone. The crowds would not be with him. The disciples would not be with him. Now I want us to look at this from a personal perspective. Is Jesus your king? Do you believe that Jesus did the things that the scripture says that Jesus did? I want the children to listen to me. Do you believe that the scripture is true and that Jesus did the things that the scripture says he did? Do you believe that Jesus is the Savior? Do you believe that he died on that awful cross and that he was buried in the grave and that he rose again from that grave? Or are you just following the large crowd to be swayed with the changing direction of a large crowd, the changing of opinion? Well, let me tell you, regardless of what you believe, one day, King Jesus will return and he will set up his kingdom. And it will be like, unlike anything we can possibly imagine. What will Jesus' kingdom be like? We've got glimpses of it in scripture, but it's just too much to write about. You can be part of that kingdom today if you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior and repent of your sins.
Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would be with those today who need to be saved. I've presented the gospel as clearly as I know how through this scripture passage about the palm branches and about why people believe that Jesus was a victorious king. Lord, we know that the crowds turned on him. Lord, help us to be faithful and never to turn. I pray that you'll be with the person today, the people today, whose hearts are convicted for their need to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. If you need to come forward to receive Jesus today, I'll be down front to pray with you. If you need to come forward for any other reason, whether you want to affiliate with us or whether you need to be baptized and follow in, in uh, Tina and Zoe's examples today. Let's stand. Brother Terry. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and Did you know that the U.S. government has chosen Nashville as a refugee resettlement district? And in South Nashville, we have people from nations all over the world who have come here to live in freedom. Our church is located right in the middle of these apartment complexes that are full of men, women, and children from all over the world. We have a great opportunity to reach out to them. Many of them are not Christians. Many of them do not know Jesus and have never even heard the name of Jesus. We've invited them to our Children's Freedom Choir. We've invited them to our Children's Vacation Bible School. We've introduced Christ to the nations. If you'd like to come and be a part of us, we'd love for you to help us with this amazing task and opportunity that we have right at our doorstep.